Inclusion Spectrum Framework, which incorporates the STEP adaptation tool, are two real handy ways in which any coach can help to make their sessions more inclusive. Now, that can be more inclusive in many ways, not just young people who have impairments, but it could be people of different ages in the same group, uh, people of different abilities in the same group. It's very rare that coaches find themselves in front of a group of young people who are all of the same ability. Usually there are uh, a range of ability within each group that you look at. So the inclusion spectrum framework, which hopefully you can see in front of you now, we're going to go through this uh, hopefully quite quickly uh, and give you a flavor of how it works. It's a, a framework designed to provide different approaches to the teaching or coaching of physical activity and sport. And there are five main components, each of these supported by the STEP adaptation tool. So I'm going to go through each of these components uh, individually. Uh, the, <clears throat> the way that the inclusion spectrum is utilized by a, a coach will depend on other factors. For instance, the way that the group is made up, the age range, uh, the ability range, uh, the, the, uh, um, <clears throat> the environment, whether it's an indoor or an outdoor activity, these will have influence. But generally speaking, this is an activity-based framework. So you're looking at the activity and how you can make that work for everyone in the group. So we're going to look open, first of all, open activities, which is, I, I subtitle, everyone can play. Uh, those activities are by nature already inclusive activities. Let me explain what I mean. In open, everyone does the same activity with minimal or no adaptations to the environment or equipment that you use. So for example, you might uh, warm ups lend themselves ideally to, uh, in, to uh, an open approach because people can warm up in the way that's best for them. You could use music or rhythm based warm ups. You can see an example here where a, a, a teacher is working with some young people and using rhythm as a way of encouraging uh, different movement. It could be unstructured play, where you might give a group of young people a small piece of equipment or ask them to work individually on uh, a particular aspect. So you might say to a group, how many ways can you balance? This allows you to observe the group uh, uh, and also assess uh, ability, who might need support, who might need to be extended because they're finding it too easy. You could also um, include in, an in open activities, cooperative games. It's games where really the group are working together to achieve an end cooperatively and collaboratively and not necessarily uh, in a competitive way or trying to, uh, um, uh, in a confrontational way. So this is cooperative activity. And another open activity is collecting or gathering games. And this could be, this particular example is a swimming based example where kids might collect floating objects from the water and bring them to uh, different collection points around the pool. You can adapt these games in many ways. Collecting and gathering games gives you as the coach uh, a way to assess movement and mobility, uh, who is uh, able to uh, respond to instruction, who is able to uh, uh, move in uh, a range of different ways. So the next part we want, want to look at is modified. Modified is where you would change the activity in order to include. So everyone is still doing the same activity, generally the whole group, but you may observe that one or two individuals require some additional support or some changes to the activity uh, that are going to enable them to participate more fully. And we're going to look at the step adaptation tool in relation to modified. You can use step with all the other parts of the spectrum, but I just want to uh, ensure that uh, in this particular um, uh, aspect, the modified aspect will look specifically at STEP. So STEP is made up of four elements, space, task, equipment, and people. And these are four areas that you can manipulate in any activity 
in order to make that activity more inclusive and uh, enable more people to participate. So we're going to look at each one of these uh, individually, space, task, equipment, and people. Space, uh, uh, you can look at, for instance, increasing or decreasing the size of the playing area. And generally speaking, in any activity, if you create a smaller space, this encourages more interaction, whether it's movement or whether it's a ball-based activity, smaller space creates more interaction between the participants, between the players. If you play in a bigger space, this promotes uh, an increase in mobility and encourages young people to move more. And you have to assess the group according to how much mobility they, they have. But there's different ways of uh, considering the, uh, the modification of space. For instance, in target activities, you can vary the distance to the target. So in lots of target-based games, basketball, football, golf, rugby, boccia, the disability sport, those are all involve some kind of a target. So you can play around with the space between the player, between the participant and the target. So for instance, if a shot is successful, you can move that person further from the target. If the, if the target's missed, then that person moves closer. So you're flexible in terms of uh, how the, uh, the activity uh, is carried out. And it enables people to begin to uh, work for themselves on uh, modifying the activity. Uh, you can also modify the playing space by, for example, creating uh, ability-based zones as part of the whole game. So for example, you might find that you're playing a whole game of basketball, but you might subdivide the uh, basketball court, perhaps lot lengthways into three zones, and you may have different abilities in each of the three zones. They're all playing basketball together, but they remain within their particular ability-based zones throughout the game. Uh, it's it's uh, just a way of enabling players to match against uh, people of uh, similar ability uh, and still be part of the whole game. You could also include safe zones. And that's where players who feel vulnerable in a very... Uh, manic kind of uh, move, a lot of mo mobility and movement and lots of people moving around a court or a playing space. Some people may feel vulnerable about that initially. And so you could create zones where those players can participate, but they cannot be marked or tackled by another player. So they have time to field the ball and pass it on to uh, one of their teammates. Uh, we're going to look at task now. Task is how you do the activity. So it's the way that the activity is performed. And there's many ways in which tasks can be modified. Here is a racket-based activity, a young uh, a guy here um, using a fast-moving sponge ball. But you might uh, have other people who are just using their hands and using a slow-moving balloon or balloon ball in order to just begin to get the rhythm and the contact that they require in order to uh, keep a ball uh, uh, moving. Or it may be using a racket, but with a slower moving uh, ball, like a beach ball or something, or something similar. So task modification, people can do the same activity as part of the group, but they can be doing it in different ways that make the activity accessible to them. The other uh, thing that we can do is perform the task in different ways. So a couple of examples. In throwing, for example, you could try uh, underarm or overarm or dart type throws, or you can, uh, so different ways using your non-dominant hand, you're trying to uh, use two hands throwing, single arm, uh, vary the challenge for the young person. Or the coach may have to break the skill down into smaller components. So for instance, under task, if we were looking at triple jump, hop, step, jump, some young people will be able to perform uh, the sequence of hop, step, and jump and put it all together uh, almost right from the start. But other young people may have to learn these components individually before they combine them into a partial or a whole sequence, perhaps the first part and the second part or the middle part and the last part before they ever get to the complete sequence. So it's breaking the skills down into uh, 
bite-sized chunks that enable the young person to uh, assimilate the individual skills required in a, in a bigger uh, series of skills. So we look at equipment now under the STEP adaptation tool. And it, it's three main things I always uh, think about in terms of equipment. You can use regular equipment in a modified way. You can adapt regular equipment for specific purposes uh, uh, or for specific individuals. Uh, and you can uh, use specially adapted equipment. So let's just look at these three things quickly. Using regular equipment in a modified way, for example, you can change the size of a ball in a, in a ball-based uh, activity to make throwing and catching easier or harder. We shouldn't always modify necessarily in order to make something easier. We may want to modify something in order to challenge young people who are finding the activity uh, not very stimulating or too easy. Uh, so if we're thinking about throwing and catching, a large ball, for example, uh, facilitates catching and a small ball is easier to throw. We often teach throwing and catching as if it's the same skill, but some young people with control and coordination impairments will find it easier to practice catching with a large ball and throwing with a small ball. So we can see the two skills as being two separate issues uh, for uh, young people initially. Uh, adapt regular equipment for specific purposes or individuals. So here's an example. If uh, quite often you think if a ball has bells that can help people track uh, the movement of a ball, uh, whether they have a vision impairment or perhaps spatial awareness uh, issues, uh, a sound ball can be um, useful, but not everyone has access to sound balls. So a simple way of creating a sound ball is to put any ball inside a plastic bag, tape it up, and when you roll the ball on the, the bag uh, on the floor, um, it crackles and people can hear it. Uh, so um, that's a, a simple way to uh, adapt an, a regular piece of equipment. Or we can look at specially adapted equipments. For example, bell balls I mentioned, foam javelins, mobility equipment that some young people may require. And then the other thing we can do is make equipment from available materials that you may find around the house. And uh, you know, I mentioned briefly at the end some uh, lockdown activities that I've been putting on video. You can make balls from newspapers. You can use plastic water bottles as targets. Uh, you can use cardboard tubes to send a ball towards a target. So we can use regular stuff you might find lying around the house and turn them into adapted equipment that can help support inclusion. If we look finally at people under step, we can adapt the way that people interact. For example, we can match players of similar ability in practice or in small-sided games or in competition. And we mentioned this earlier. If uh, you have people who are of a similar ability, you will get more opportunity to participate in the activity, handle the ball, uh, practice rallies, whatever the activity is that you're doing. We can also vary the team numbers. And this is quite an important one. People tend to think five against five, seven against seven, 11 against 11, but teams don't always have to be of equal size. So you may find that instead of five against five, seven against three might work better. Three players who have higher skill levels have to work very hard against seven players who can support each other in the game. And finally on the people, some individuals might require some kind of one-to-one -one support. For example, guidance and target orientation for young people who have vision impairments. So someone, for example, creating some kind of noise above a target so that a person with vision impairment can uh, uh, better estimate where the target is. Uh, or alternative or innovative, innovative, innovative methods of communication and explanation for some young people. You may have to avoid jargon until it becomes familiar with, uh, until young people become familiar with it, for example. Uh, and so uh, we can modify the way we communicate in order to make an activity more inclusive. Okay, to look at parallel, uh, and I'm trying to move on quickly. I'm, I know I'm uh, uh, going over my time here. 
Parallel is uh, fine, Ken, carry on. part of the spectrum. Players work on the same activity or theme, but they do in groups based upon their ability. So we've mentioned this before, but instead of them all being in the same game and we create perhaps ability zones, we can actually, where there's a very wide range of ability within the, uh, within the, the whole group, we can create smaller subgroups, two or more. So for example, you might have a volleyball type game where some people play a seated version and others play a standing version and people move to the group that best suits their abilities. Give you some examples. This is a sitting volleyball example. You might have one group that is practicing basic skills using slow moving balloons, for example, just learning to keep the balloons in the air. You may have another group where you introduce a barrier. They're getting the idea that volleyball is about two groups of people facing each other and they can begin to uh, negotiate using a slow moving ball, the fact that they have a barrier to uh, overcome. And finally, you can introduce a net and it begins to look like uh, sitting volleyball and you can begin to introduce basic rules and a basic uh, playing area that uh, mirrors the, uh, the game. Finally, oh, it's not finally, but we're going to look at separate and alternate quickly. Some people would say, well, why would you have in an inclusion framework separate and alternate? But there may be good reasons on occasion where you might want to separate young people from the rest of the group. Uh, and the examples might be um, to uh, where you might want young people to work individually or with peers of similar ability. You might want to give them more time to develop the skill levels that will enable them to be reintegrated into the main group. Or you may want them to spend some time practicing specific skills. For instance, if they have a competition coming up, which is perhaps as part of a disability sport program, at some point they have to practice that with their, uh, with their uh, disabled peers. But what I would say about uh, separate and alternate is it should not be most of the time. It's just when required in order to uh, enable a young person to increase their uh, skill and uh, level and competency and it, to enable them to get back into the main group. Uh, disability sport is the last part of the spectrum. And here, if I can get on to the, here we go. Uh, let me, I've jumped on uh, a little bit too quickly. Here we go. This is uh, what we would call reverse integration, where non-disabled players are included in disability sport or adapted physical activity with their disabled peers. And we feel this is very important that in every sports program, at some point, if you have some uh, uh, young disabled people who are part of the program, that they are at the center and we reverse integrate the non-disabled young people into their activities so that they are uh, in the comfort zone and not always having to uh, be integrated into uh, uh, so-called mainstream activity. Examples of uh, disability sport or adaptive physical activity where we integrate um, disabled and non-disabled people together, uh, Special Olympics uh, Unified Sports, for example, which uh, uh, Fiona may mention later, wheelchair sports, games like boccia and goalball, who are, which are Paralympic sports. And there's many, many more where you can uh, apply this uh, process. So I'm going to finish now with some uh, uh, links. Um, I just wanted to mention the fact, and I think Fiona's already mentioned it, we're in lockdown mode in many parts of the world. And um, if you check out the Inclusion Club, which uh, I was fortunate to co-found with uh, Peter Downs in Australia, in 2011, we launched it. Uh, there's a couple of new videos up there, uh, which are activities, inclusive activities that you can do at home using uh, ready, readily available materials around the house. So uh, check those out. Second, um, the Youth Sport Trust, I've got colleagues and friends there who I've worked with for many years, and they have a whole bunch of uh, different resources available at, on their website, but there's one in, particular I want to uh, draw to your attention, and that's uh, this uh, free home learning resources. Uh, I've got some inclusive videos on there, but there's loads of other videos to, to, um, provided by and presented by PE teachers showing uh, lots of different sports skills. 
and it's it's uh, things that young people could do at home on their own. Uh, and uh, please check out that one. And finally, if you want to review uh, um, what we've talked about uh, so far, the inclusion spectrum and step, then I coach kids have produced two fantastic videos, um, which uh, um, uh, Sergio and his uh, colleagues have put together. Um, I was lucky to be involved with those. And uh, these are uh, the links for those videos. So thanks very much.